the opportunity to uh, give a presentation on some of the work we're doing regarding uh, climate uh, policy, climate activities that deal with Congress. Um, just, to, I guess, a little bit of my background. Uh, name again is Eric Carduño. I'm uh, part of the Legislative Affairs Team for Catholic Relief Services. I've been with Catholic Relief Services for about four years. And actually, most of my uh, work has been focused on food security. Uh, so things like maybe you've heard in the news, Food for Peace program or the Feed the Future program. Uh, those are those are issues I worked on quite a bit. Um, when we decided to really start engaging on climate, uh, we were looking at uh, where uh, climate really overlapped existing programming. And more than anywhere else, it, it really does overlap in the food security area where you have floods or droughts impacting farmers all around the world having uh, who are having a hard time as is uh, trying to provide for their families, the impacts of climate change and, and uh, the um, changes in weather patterns that it, uh, it's producing has really made it very difficult for farmers to, to get ahead, especially the smallholder farmers that we tend to work with. And so for the last uh, year or so, I've been working on climate change issues for climate uh, for uh, Catholic Relief Services. And uh, again, I'm very happy and pleased to, to be part of this and, um, uh, I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, there we go. Um, so, just uh, sort of as a as a background, um, climate change, as everybody has probably heard, is, is going to actually impact uh, the poorest countries of the world. Uh, this map it comes from the Notre Dame uh, Global Adaptation Index. Uh, they have. Um, actually different maps dealing with vulnerability, uh, ability for countries to adapt to climate change, sort of amalgamation. This one is the vulnerability map. There's actually a number of different uh, studies and indices out there that sort of map where the major impacts of climate change are going to, to take place. Um, this one uh, is noted as the one that does with vulnerability. And as you can see, uh, there are a number of developing countries, especially uh, sub-Saharan African countries that are going to be uh, hugely impacted by um, by climate change. Whether you look at this in, in index or some of the others that are out there, uh, the regions of the world that are going to be most impacted are going to be um, more or less the same because uh, the numbers are just there in terms of, uh, again, going to the droughts, the floods, uh, prevalence for diseases, um, the ability for countries uh, to actually do something about climate change uh, with their own resources and uh, at, at their disposal. Uh, they're the ones that are going to be most impacted are going to be uh, so the least developed countries. Um, and a lot of them are, are pretty clearly noted in this, in this map here. What is Catholic Relief Services doing on climate change? Well, as I noted, we've been working on climate change in, in a variety of, uh, for a while, in a variety of areas, mostly for um, in the food security area, but uh, certainly not just in there. Um, our work, uh, we've designed various uh, activities in the programs that we implement to deal with uh, climate change. Uh, we also have a number of guides and studies looking at the impacts of climate change and, of course, uh, our advocacy. This is where I come in as part of the legislative affairs team. Um, our advocacy is a huge component as well, um, trying to change uh, minds and hearts within Congress on how to deal with uh, the issue of climate change. And I, I just want to note, I guess, a couple of things that, that we have been, uh, we're learning as we're helping folks uh, deal with climate change. And one of the things is that uh, Climate change in itself isn't, may, isn't necessarily creating new problems per se, but it's exacerbating existing problems. And I'll give you two good examples. Um, one example is uh, coffee leaf rust in Central America. Central America is a major uh, region of the world that, that grows coffee. And uh, the coffee farmers there um, are, are having to contend with uh, something called coffee leaf rust. Now, this, this is a disease that impacts the, um, the coffee plants and, and essentially kills them. And uh, the, the farmers in Central America have actually been dealing with coffee leaf rust for quite some time. That said, uh, with the growing impacts of climate change, what we're seeing is coffee leaf rust uh, impacting more farmers because it's increased in the geographical scope of 
uh, the, the disease for these plants. And it's in increasing the intensity of the disease and how it's impacting these plants. And so um, may, maybe at one time we had only a handful of farmers having to deal with it. And now we're seeing the spread of this disease in, in areas that they've never seen it before. And so um, that's, at, at the end of the day, impacting a lot of small, for, uh, small farmers in Central America and they're having to switch their crops or um, adapt using different techniques to, to try to stave off um, the impacts of this coffee leaf rust. Another um, good example is, uh, is uh, climate and, and sort of weather patterns that we're seeing in, in uh, East Africa. The El Nino effect, as you probably have heard in the news, uh, uh, is uh, quite large this year. And uh, I think for those in California, you might see uh, a much wetter winter this year. And uh, what we're hearing here in uh, Washington, D.C. is the potential for a lot more snow. Well, the, the impact of El Nino isn't just in the United States. It's also around the world. And what we're seeing in the Horn of Africa, East Africa, is a lot more variability in the types of uh, weather impacts. For instance, more floods, uh, uh, more impactful floods uh, hitting wider areas, and the same thing with droughts. Um, I can note right now, again, uh, going back to the point, uh, I'm working on uh, a lot of food security activities for, for Catholic Relief Services, and one of the things that um, uh, we're paying very close attention to is the impact that uh, El Nino has had on the um, drought that Ethiopia is now uh, in the middle of. It, the rains this year really did not come, uh, but what we're seeing different from years past, and certainly Ethiopia is no, no stranger to droughts, but what we're seeing different from years past is that Ethiopia is... Um, seeing drought in the highlands. Usually the, the drought is limited to the lowland uh, areas where there's a lot of uh, agricultural um, output. And the highlands we've been able in at least years past to bring water down uh, to help alleviate some of the suffering in the lowlands. Uh, unfortunately this year the highlands are, are looking at drought conditions as well which which means that water scarcity is is really rocketed up in in Ethiopia and we're quite concerned actually that uh, we'll we'll see uh, huge numbers uh, of people needing emergency food aid ultimately over the course of the next year in Ethiopia and, and again this is sort of all the result of the growing impacts that uh, El Nino has and and connecting it back that climate change has on increasing the impacts of El Nino. So, uh, those are just a couple quick examples, but uh, certainly we have a number of other examples on our webpage, which uh, I have listed here. Um, as you guys have, and we have, of course, as well, uh, our main policy, policy objectives, or at least in the near term related to climate change is uh, to secure funding U.S. funding for the Green Climate Fund and um, to see that the U.S. provides strong leadership in its uh, participation in the Paris negotiations uh, for, U for the United uh, Nations Climate Treaty. Um, I'll just move on. So the Green Climate Fund, um, I think some of you are familiar with this, but uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, the Green Climate Fund was started uh, as part of the uh, UN climate negotiations um, was formally announced a couple years back. This year it has received enough funding, um, actual cash in hand from pledges uh, to, to start uh, issuing both grants and, uh, and loans. The uh, idea behind the Green Climate Fund is to help primarily uh, developing countries adapt and mitigate the impacts of climate change. Now, the um, history of funds dealing with climate change has been focused primarily on mitigation. And to, I guess, um, to give you a little context, mitigation is the adoption, largely the adoption of um, technologies that will help reduce the output of greenhouse gas gases. Well, adaptation is helping people um, change the way they're doing things now to live with uh, with the impacts of climate change that, that we're seeing and that we forecast. And so uh, the fund has been, or at least the idea behind the fund is to split overall funding 
uh, that it issues uh, evenly between mitigation and adaptation activities. Um, the funding that has been received has uh, been pledged by developing countries. Uh, the actually the the last number I read was it's uh, at about 10.2 billion in in pledges uh, total, and about half of that has been committed with actual cash in hand. Um, this is not counting a recent pledge actually by China, uh, which pledged 3.1 billion dollars. Uh, China actually is the only country that has pledged more than the United States. The U.S. has pledged a total of $3 billion over the course of the next four years. And so uh, in this year's uh, budget request that the president puts out, this is an annual document that, the, that every administration puts out, identifying what its policy objectives are and how it would like to see funded. It has uh, indicated in that document that it'd like to uh, dedicate 500 million this year towards that overall 3 billion um, to the Green Climate Fund. And that's, that's something that we have certainly supported. Then Paris negotiations. Um, what we'd like to certainly see is uh, U.S. take a strong leadership position in Paris. That means uh, going in there with a commitment to uh, cut down greenhouse gases and a strong commitment that will hopefully give uh, the United States then moral authority to, to really push other nations to make similar uh, impactful commitments. Now, the U.S. commitment is actually uh, is, is going to be in a little bit different form than what other countries are, are approaching it. Now, most countries who are participating in the, in the negotiations have done or, or plan to do um, uh, to sign the, the UN Climate Treaty. The United States has not signed that treaty and does not plan to. That said, what it has done is taken steps to uh, achieve up to a 28% reduction in greenhouse gases. And essentially it is a political promise from the current administration to, uh, to achieve this objective and um, not necessarily sign it as a treaty, but this is, this is essentially the, the plan laid out by the administration. So uh, they're hoping to go into Paris with that as a sufficient commitment um, to the other parties to, to say, this is what we're, we're willing to do. We're hoping everybody else is willing to do some, at least something as impactful. Now, I, I should note before I move on, I should note that the reason that they're not signing the treaty um, largely uh, stems to our current political situation. Um, that is of course uh, a climate within Congress that would be fairly um, opposed to signing such a treaty. The, the Constitution lays out that if the United States uh, enters in a treaty, it has to be with the advice and consent of the Senate. So any treaty that the U.S. does sign has to be passed essentially by and approved by the Senate. Under current um, makeup of the Senate, it, the administration uh, believes that it would not be able to get a treaty passed there. And so uh, instead of uh, seeking to formally be part of the UN treaty, uh, what they are doing is this political promise as, as a way to at least uh, achieve the objective, if not um, you know, put it, 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 the US fully out there as part of a, a treaty member. Now, um, what I want to do is go into to some of the legislative background uh, of what we're doing, dealing with in both, both in terms of the Green Climate Fund and uh, Paris negotiations. But before I do that, I'll, again, I want to make sure we're all on the, the same page in terms of legislative basics so that you have an understanding of where things are in the process. Um, so the, the, the basic legislative process is that uh, any, any piece of legislation a bill that it you know seeks to do something uh, has to be introduced in one of the bodies of Congress. We have the Senate and the, and the House of Representatives, so it has to be introduced in one of those bodies. Um, it will be referred to uh, a committee and probably a subcommittee, and so the subcommittee has to take a look at that legislation and uh, through a um, majority vote pass it out of committee or subcommittee, depending on what level you're at. 
And then once it's out of the committee level, it goes to the full chamber, whether it's the House of Representatives or the Senate. And then it has to be passed out of uh, that chamber. Once it's out of that chamber, ideally there will be um, somewhat matching legislation passed out also from the uh, other chamber. So if the House of Representatives passes a bill, hopefully there's a corresponding bill that's also gone through the legislative process on the Senate side. Um, when that happens, there's a conference for that bill. So the House and Senate essentially uh, nominate people to negotiate, hammer out essentially a compromise that is an amalgamation of the House and Senate bills. Uh, both houses, once that's done, both houses uh, uh, vote for a final passage of the uh, compromise bill, and then the president signs or, or if he doesn't like it, vetoes the bill. That is the normal legislative process. I will note um, oftentimes there's ways to skip various uh, pieces of this process. There, uh, and frankly, most bills these days uh, do not go through this entire process. Some of the bigger ones, more important ones, do, but uh, largely a, a lot of these bills uh, skip various components uh, of the process. Uh, another part, uh, another uh, legislative uh, basic to, to keep in mind is that there's two types of, of bills. There is an authorization bill, and then there is an appropriations bill. And the best way to understand the difference between the two is that an authorization bill uh, sets up a program and creates the basic uh, rules and guidelines on how that program is supposed to operate. Um, while an appropriations bill, this is a yearly bill that funds um, the actual activities uh, that, was author that were authorized. And so uh, what we have yearly are 12 appropriations bills and each of those bills go tends tends to to go through the subcommittee and committee markup. And then what we have seen in recent years is that instead of uh, you know passing out of either chamber or or um, going to a a conference with those uh, those bills pass out of chamber, they just skip straight to the conference and do what uh, Congress does. What what people often have probably heard is an omnibus bill. They basically put all the appropriations bills in one big bill and uh, hammer out a final deal at the end of the year to get it passed and fund the, the federal government. Um, and so that, that's, I, I hope that that explains to, to everybody sort of that difference between appropriations and authorization and, and sort of uh, the craziness that is the legislative process. Um, and I note all this uh, just to give you a sense of where things are when it, in the process when it comes to uh, legislation related to the Green Climate Fund and uh, Paris negotiations. Um, before I go into the next slide, just uh, one thing else to note is that in terms of this, uh, the appropriations bills most important for our work um, in this area, it, it actually is the appropriation, of one of the 12 um, is the state and foreign operations appropriations. And that is the one that funds the Green Climate Fund. Uh, that's where um, any U.S. contributions to that uh, uh, to the Green Climate Fund will come out of. And so, where are we? Well, the House Appropriations uh, Committee has passed their bill for the state and foreign operations appropriations, and the Senate has done the same. And that's where we're stuck now in pretty much limbo in, until. And if uh, there is a final um, deal to fund the government for the rest of the year. That said, there's been some fairly important things that have happened in both bills. Uh, the House bill has a provision, unfortunately, uh, in it that explicitly prohibits the use of any funds uh, to go towards the Green Climate Fund. That makes it a uh, impossible uh, barrier to to funding for U.S. contributions towards the Green Climate Fund. In the Senate, there was uh, language actually in the original introduction of the State and Foreign Operations Appropriations Bill to uh, to also that would also prohibit the um, funding of uh, of any U.S. contribution to the Green Climate Fund. That thankfully during the committee process was defeated and eliminated, that provision was defeated and eliminated in a 16 to 14 vote 
Um, I will note because this is this is sort of important. Uh, all the Democrats and then Senators Kirk and Collins, both Republicans, joined in that vote and thus made a bipartisan vote to to preserve funding for the Green Climate Fund within the Senate Appropriations Bill. Um, this was a huge victory, actually, for the Green Climate Fund, and uh, we're very supportive of this. Uh, I will note that uh, certainly there's been a lot of partisan, partisan politics around uh, funding for the Green Climate Fund, as well as the Paris negotiations, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But to the extent that uh, you guys, and certainly what we're doing, is um, making sure that those members of Congress who have been helpful when it comes to uh, climate uh, action it, are, are thanked and that they have the support to the extent that we can we can demonstrate it of their constituents uh, for their their work on on climate related uh, uh, legislation so um, I know Kirk and Collins here because they were uh, actually instrumental um, crossing their party line to to um, support funding for the green climate fund uh, another bill that's uh, sort of out there regarding the Green Climate Fund, we don't think it's going to go anywhere at this point, but uh, I will note it anyway because it does uh, it does uh, demonstrate the sentiment of a number of members of Congress is, is H.R. 383, No Tax Dollars for the United Nations Climate Agenda Act. Um, this bill was uh, introduced uh earlier in the year and the objective of it is to ensure that no U.S. funds are used to support the Green Climate Fund or um, any sort of uh, agreement that is made by the United States at uh, the Paris negotiations. Uh, so that's something that uh, we were definitely not supportive of and um, you know to the extent that you meet with any members of Congress that uh, are uh, supporters of this uh, of this bill, uh, it would be useful to them to to let them know that that it would be that you would prefer that they did not do that. <laughs> uh, let let me just sorry just to just to finish things up. So we're we do have this victory in the Senate appropriations. The House appropriations, unfortunately, is not in a good place. What we hope to see ultimately at the end of um, at the end of the day is an omnibus appropriations bill that is is silent. In an ideal world, it would actually provide explicitly funding for the Green Climate Fund, but um, we don't live in the ideal world, unfortunately. And, and what we'd like to ultimately see, you know, um, at the end of the day is uh, the appropriations silent on whether or not funding can go towards the Green Climate Fund. Uh, in that case, uh, the administration would have uh, the the opportunity it's to use its prerogative um, because Congress was silent on the matter uh, to use its prerogative and authority to use existing funds to to devote towards the Green Climate Fund. Um, we're looking at probably the end uh, or sorry the uh, beginning of December for that final appropriations bill to to be hammered out. Hopefully it will be an omnibus. Uh, there are things. Uh, that Congress could do that wouldn't be an omnibus that would not be as good for us uh, when it comes to funding for the Green Climate Fund. And I can get into that in the Q&A if anybody would like to, to know more about that. And then the legislative landscape for Paris negotiations. Um, just to be clear that, uh, uh, I actually am gonna to skip to the other legislation and actions. Um, a lot of the activities uh, that, com that bring the US in, uh, in compliance with its political commitment uh, for Paris uh, are regulatory activities that are being undertaken uh, largely by the EPA. We're looking at efficiency rules for appliances, uh, fuel efficiency rules for cars, and um, uh, stricter uh, guidelines for um, power plants that uh, use fossil fuels as, as their main uh, fuel source. And so these different uh, uh, things, uh, actions by the administration, you probably have heard in the news, uh, oftentimes uh, associated with either court challenge or maybe even provisions in legislation that will uh, try to, to undo uh, these actions. Uh, largely, these actions deal with U.S., uh, sort of U.S. activities 
where, which for Catholic Relief Services, we're not so much focused on, on Catholic Relief Services, of course, being the international humanitarian and development arm of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Our, our focus when it comes to impacts related to uh, or legislative impacts to Paris really are, are more focused on um, sort of the uh, direct efforts by Congress to undermine uh, the U.S. position within Paris, or at least that's where our focus has been thus far. And so what we're we're looking at and concerned about, again, is this H.R. 383 that would prohibit uh, any sort of U.S. agreement in Paris. Um, there's a, a resolution, and a, a H resolution, uh, House Resolution 218, um, and Senate Re- Resolution 290. I should note, in both cases, resolutions are, as noted here, are essentially statements by Congress and not necessarily binding and that will require the administration to do one thing or another. That said, it still galvanizes you know, support for a, a particular point of view. And so to the extent that there are members of Congress who are supportive of these resolutions, um, we, I, I think it's incumbent upon us to, to really let them know that this isn't the direction we'd like to see things go. And so going back to the list here, HRES 2, uh, 218 um, is a re- resolution that's put out that, that essentially says that uh, developing countries have to, have to take on uh, similar levels of commitments that developed countries have to take on uh, if there's going to be any agreement in Paris. Well, in, in some ways, this might make sense, certainly to certain legislators. Um, the, the the fact of the matter is that developing countries, again, uh, are the least to blame for greenhouse gas, gas emissions and um, have... Uh, very oftentimes have very little little wiggle room uh, to actually be able to cut their emissions. That said, there are certainly a number of uh, developed countries that have made pledges, and that's something we encourage to the extent that that it's feasible for them to to pledge. That's that we, we don't want to see the uh, U.S. participation conditioned on whether or not developing countries are are able to do this, though. And then the uh, other resolution, S Res two ninety. Um, it actually just came out, and it uh, it essentially is is saying that it's it's the Senate's opinion that um, any agreement, regardless of whether or not the administration calls it a treaty, uh, needs to uh, go through Senate conf- uh, um, Senate through it the Senate approval approval process. Um, this, I think, uh, I will note um, probably. Uh, makes sense a little bit on paper, but the the ultimate um, outcome, if the um, U.S. commitments were to be treated as a treaty and go through Senate uh, advice and consent, um, would be that the, they would be disapproved, um, given the current political makeup of the Senate. I'll just note a couple other bills out there that deal with climate change in some way or another. Uh, there's S-2076 that uh, deals with super pollutants. Uh, these are gases like methane that have uh, extra, I guess, an extra big bang on uh, on climate change uh, compared to uh, carbon emissions. And then there's uh, HRES 424. Uh, this is actually something that we're, uh, um, we did a little bit of uh, grassroots work around. This is a a bill by all Republicans that essentially um, underscore the importance of conservation and uh, environmental stewardship, and it was their showing that uh, climate change is important to them and their districts. And then uh, SRS 244 uh, was a a resolution in the Senate that uh, uh, really... um, to put a, put a uh, highlight on uh, Let Auto See, the Pope's encyclical, and and uh, ex- uh, exclaiming how how great it is, and um, how we as a nation really need to to take a look at that. Which you know, as a Catholic organization, Catholic organizations, uh, I think we we can all get it behind. Um, as you guys go um, to your meetings. And given the sort of outline I, I just put together of these different bills, I wanted to to give you sort of the names of, of the members of Congress who uh, are 
are behind these different uh, pieces of legislation. Uh, the top group are those uh, pieces of legislation that we would not support because they, in one way or another, undermined funding for the Green Climate Fund and or U.S. Uh, positions in Paris. And then the uh, the legislation uh, on the lower side, lower end here, are uh, pieces of legislation that we do support because they make a commitment to, to deal with climate change in, in one way or another. And so... Uh, as you guys go through um, Congress and, and knock on doors and, and reach out to, to members of Congress about uh, your feelings on, on climate change, please keep in mind these different uh, members of Congress and where they stand. Um, if you go into, for instance, uh, Representative uh, Luke Meyer's office, you're probably not going to have a great reception. That said, um, it's important, extremely important to, to get uh, into that kind of office and, and let them know that there are constituents back home that that care about climate change and, and would prefer he take a different uh, perspective on it. And then when we're talking about uh, uh, the legislation at the bottom, uh, please, by all means, let them know uh, that you're thankful for, for their stand, for their willingness to, to put their neck on the line, especially, uh, I, have, I have to say, especially the Republicans. Uh, Republicans have been generally um, not supportive of climate uh, change activities, uh, funding for those programs or, or authorization of those programs. Um, but there are certainly members that have crossed their party line to uh, take a stand on climate. And, and to the extent that um, you have an opportunity as you're making your visits, uh, I, would, I would definitely encourage you to, to thank them for making that stand. And then lastly, um, so underscoring what I just said, we need to send Congress the message that climate change is absolutely important and that uh, not just important for, you know, Pope Francis or the, you know, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops or Catholic Relief Services, but important to their constituents, that their constituents care about this issue. Without constituent voices, to, to be the counterweight to whatever a lot of these members are listening to, we're not going to see changes uh, made in, in Congress. And that, that's where the changes really need to be made. And so I implore everybody certainly to let their members of Congress know how important uh, climate change and dealing with climate change and certainly the, the two uh, objectives that we have uh, for you now, and it's funding for the Green Climate Fund and um, uh, U.S. leadership in Paris. Uh, it's important to get those messages to them uh, now and between now and and really the beginning of December. Uh, in addition to to sort of uh, your own personal outreach, in, in some ways you can do this as part of your personal outreach. Uh, USCCB and CRS, along with uh, probably a few other Catholic organizations, will be issuing a letter in the very near future that uh, highlight these two major objectives, uh, Green Climate Fund and, and Paris negotiations. Uh, what I would encourage you to do is once we issue that, um, uh, send that to your member of Congress, let them know that you support, you know, what's in this letter. Uh, if, um, well, I'm, I'm sure that your network will, will certainly have them, uh, have copies of this letter available to you. And, and if not, uh, you can also, uh, if you're part of uh, Catholics Confront Global Poverty, um, you'll be able to get the letter through that um, through that network. And then, lastly, uh, there are efforts underfoot to get members of Congress uh, to sign letters of support for the Green Climate Fund and uh, U.S. leadership in in Paris. Um, we're in the process right now, actually, of of securing um, names on a letter. Uh, bipartisan letter in the Senate. Uh, from my understanding, Senator Kirk uh, and Senator Merkley have both um, uh, agreed to be the lead signers of this letter, and we're in the process of getting more uh, members of Congress on, on it. And so as opportunities arise for grassroots to help push this sort of effort, we would, we would certainly help, uh, hope that you would consider helping out in, in this as well. And um, I think that's that concludes uh, what I have to say. I, I'm happy to take any questions uh, you guys might have on some of the things I said. Um, and uh, really look forward to working with you guys uh, um, on this issue.
Thank you, Eric. Um, right now I am going through and unmuting each of you. So just give me about 10 seconds here. <laughs> Okay, at this point, each of you are unmuted. So if you have any questions that you would like to share with Eric, um, please feel free to ask them. And if you're having trouble um, connecting and would still like to ask a question, you can use that chat function and I will pass along the question. This one's uh, audio. Hi, I was wondering if you could repeat what the three billion in funding is for from the United States. I didn't quite catch that. Would you mind repeating a little bit about the three billion funding? Oh, sure. What that goes for. Okay, so um, I maybe to give a little bit more context, the, there was about, I think it was two, two, two and a half years ago, um, it was agreed to that uh, at one of these uh, UN um, negotiation sessions leading up to, to Paris, that about 100, 100 billion would be needed to, to deal with climate change in developing countries. Um, and from there, uh, the Green Climate uh, fund was, was essentially born as the main mechanism to to uh, take in these funds and then distribute them to to those uh, developing countries in need. And um, what the United States has pledged since is, at least initially, is to uh, provide three billion over the course of four years towards the Green Climate Fund as part of this overall hundred billion dollar commitment made by. Uh, developing countries in, in the course of the UN negotiations. And so, uh, again, it's over three years. The first tranche uh, that the administration has put out um, is requested uh, to go towards the Green Climate Fund is 500 million. And that was done in this year's uh, presidential budget request. And uh, what Congress has done, unfortunately, is uh, not provided any direct funding for the Green Climate Fund as yet. In either the House or Senate uh, State and Foreign Operations Appropriations. That said, going back to what has happened in, in the Senate, um, they did uh, eliminate the sort of roadblock that would have prevented existing funds to go towards uh, the Green Climate Fund. So it, largely it's it's silent, which means the administration then will have, uh, it's will be able to use its discretion to use um, the existing funds that are appropriated to channel it towards the Green Climate Fund. Assuming that the Senate uh, approach ultimately wins the day, which we're very hopeful for. Thanks. Sure. I've got another question here from Carl, and he's asking if you know if the letters um, your organization is crafting will be ready by, by November 9th. Yes. The answer is definitely yes. Uh, I am expecting, if not tomorrow, early next week, the USCCB CRS letter will be out. And then um, we will be, once we get the okay from uh, the lead sponsors of this uh, congressional support letter, uh, we'll, we'll try to uh, utilize our grassroots networks to, to, to get um, support uh, from uh, at least a certain targeted members to, to join. But at, at, present, I, at present, I should note that it's not a public letter yet, otherwise I would share it. Okay, thanks. But if they were to Our delegation. Money, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to just move on to a different question, so finish, the, finish your thought, Tim. Well, if they're in meetings, would that be something that they could mention, though? Or would it still be not public at that point on November 9th? I would imagine it's public by then, and uh, you would be able to mention it. That's actually one of the reasons I wanted to note it here. So okay. keep your eyes open, <laughs> and please do. And this would be this particular letter that we're working on um, is a, is directed in the Senate. So any senators that you meet with, you'd want to encourage them to be part of that uh, congressional support letter. Carl says thanks. 
our Walsh Jesuit High School delegation is going to be meeting with one of the representatives who is against this, um, Bob, or Representative Gibbs. Do you have any advice or particular um, words of wisdom that we can use in our strategy and our conversation with his office? I, um, I, I've had some pretty rough conversations and w with members who are, who are uh, on sort of our, the opposite side of us on this issue. And they often come back with, well, the science isn't clear. It's stuff you guys have seen in, in the news. The science isn't clear. There's no clear evidence that, that humans are, are um, causing climate change. And, um, and uh, they're concerned about the economic impacts in the United States um, of, of taking uh, measures to address our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I think there's a couple of different uh, points that, that do resonate, however, uh, when we come back with it. One, it, you know, this is a, our, our you know, uh, our leader, uh, Pope Francis, has made this very much a moral issue and a core component of what, what it means to be a person of faith. Um, I, I would invite you, if you haven't already, take a, take a good look at Laudato C. There's a couple of really great quotes that I've used that, that really point out that um, if you consider yourself a, a person of faith, and, and many of the um, members of Congress who are uh, who tend to be against this uh, do uh, the the sort of faith message does resonate with them, and, and so underscoring that certainly helps, letting them know that um, you can't be passive about this, you can't sit the sidelines, you have a moral obligation to be part of the solution. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there are actually a number of business groups that are starting to come out very strongly in support of uh, measures to, to deal with climate change. And if you can't get them from a moral uh, angle, you can at least try uh, sort of the business angle. That um, A good example, uh, we just did a panel to discussion in Congress uh, that included uh, Mars, Mars Inc. This is the uh, company behind the Mars bar, uh, and a lot of other great chocolate, uh, uh, chocolate treats. Um, what they're concerned about actually is, is uh, their supply chain. Uh, cocoa is gonna be a lot harder to grow, harder to come by if climate change uh, becomes a reality in a lot of the developing countries that, they, that they're sourcing their, their chocolate from. Uh, so this is going to impact their bottom line, and so they're they're taking steps as a company to to try to help people in developing countries adapt to climate change. Um, you're going to find actually similar stories by a number of companies, and um, there are I, I don't have them handy right now, but I can certainly provide them as a follow up. Some websites that uh, that uh, uh, companies have put together to sort of uh, rally around the the message that. Uh, climate change, dealing with climate change is important to their bottom line. And thus, the U.S. should, you know, uh, take steps to uh, curb its greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, I can certainly provide that uh, as follow-up. And then um, lastly, uh, th this was a conference that just happened yesterday. A number of um, former uh, military officials have come out to say that climate change is a huge national security issue that it's going to cause instability in, in a number of different countries that, are, that um, could, could lead to, unfortunately, US, additional U.S. engagement. Uh, that's certainly something that we don't want to see, and um, it's something that we can potentially avoid if we, try to, if we tackle the pro problem now. So there, there's these sort of three different angles to come back at. Um, I don't know if any of them, any particular one will resonate with, uh, with Representative Gibbs, but uh, I, I'd love to hear how, how it goes. All right, looks like we have time for one more question. Are there any final questions from the group? I was wondering, um, if speaking right now, if you could tell one more time, you're breaking up a little bit. It looks like it might be Louisa trying to speak. If you could try the chat function and type in your question, that might be an easier way to ask it.
<clears throat> okay. Um, so her question is, who exactly is the S-2076 bill targeting certain corporations that pollute heavily or some, someone else? S-2076? Yes. Uh, I, think, I think that bill is actually focused on federal government uh, facilities to reduce their, their output of super pollutants. All right, great. Well, if um, we are approaching our, um, the end of our time, so if folks have follow-up questions, um, you have Eric's contact, so um, he will be able to answer any, any follow-up questions that folks have. I also will be sending everyone that attended this meeting a link to this webinar as well as the three others that have been uh, posted throughout the week. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and if you have any um, additional resources that you think would be helpful to share with folks, please please send them to me. Um, my email is kmiller at ignatiansolidarity.net. So to all of you, thank you. Um, thank you, Eric, for being here with us and providing um, insights as well as uh, some answers to some questions that the folks our folks have for our November 9th meeting. I'm looking sure, forward to seeing all of you on the Hill. Um, this will be our largest advocacy day ever with about 1,200 people headed to Capitol Hill. So hopefully with our combined voices, we will be able to um, really help make an impact. So thank you we all. Need to move that needle. Yes, exactly. And I'll be happy to follow up with you with some of these uh, letters uh, once they're available. Sounds good. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.